Hello, Hello good, good morning. morning, how are you? My name's Lee, I'm an artist. Um, um, some of you already know that already. Um, and I've been doing ArtCAD for quite a while now. Uh, so basically every Saturday I just jump online and let everybody know what I'm doing, what I've been at. We talk about different things, we talk about different artworks that we're doing. Uh, it's about you and the artworks that you're doing and questions you might have with your artwork and problems you might have and discussion that way. I'll talk about what I've been doing. You can just sit back and just listen if you want to, but if you do want to ask any questions, please feel free to do so. I'm going live on Instagram, Facebook, Twitch and YouTube all at the same time, so I've got all my windows open. And it's basically a, a, a very uh, easy going live stream, uh, and it's about you and what you're doing with your artwork. And I've been working on these paintings now for... I'll just show you this painting. Now, for the last month or so, two couple of months, there was a hiatus of about two years. You know, when you start a work and you're not quite too sure what's happening with it and you put it down and you get on with other stuff and it kind of sits in the corner. I always wanted to go back to the project and through lockdown it's kind of reintroduced itself to me. So, uh, yeah, that's what we've been working on. Um, I've been doing different things as well, working on different uh, artworks and projects and different drawings. Uh, last week I was working on the next Mammalian drawing, this is what the range of series of work is called, Mammalian, and I kind of was briefly chatting, it was only a quick stream, it was only about an hour long, this might only be about an hour long too, and I'll just flip that around so you can see it, and for you guys on Facebook, YouTube and Twitch, hopefully you get to see that as well. So this was the initial stages of, a, of an artwork. I'd worked out the idea for it already. Um, this is, these are all based on a conversation I had with friends and the artwork of the uh, portrait is based on that conversation of them and about them. Uh, the only question I asked of each person was if they were an animal, what would they be? And in some format, I've worked that animal into the picture. So in this particular one, Damien, uh, he actually chose two uh, for a really good reason. He had done quite a lot of uh, thought, put a lot of thought in behind it. So we have a wolf and a baboon. And I decided to kind of, Damien's a really funny guy as well, and keep that sense of humour to it. That they've become the flock wallpaper in the background. So it's like a repeated pattern. Uh, so I've initially sketched out kind of the positioning of the baboon and the wolf. Um, this is his portrait. It's actually the back of his head. And we've also got uh, down here a little photo strip that you get in a photo booth. Um, and there'll be the uh, little minuet portraits as well. And a little candle in the bottom left hand corner. So I kind of was sketching loosely out, talking in general terms about composition and pictures and uh, the whole kind of reason behind doing these, these works. So that was got to a stage now where I'm kind of happy with the composition of it. You can't really tell the quality of light and colour that I'm going to put into this. Um, but I wanted to get to a stage where I was ready to do the next picture whilst I've still got a painting on the, on the go. Because it's a nice break, that kind of uh, time away that... that um, a little pause. Hi. Hi. Desserts. Good to see you. You joined us on Instagram. Um, so yeah, the work that I'm working on at the moment is a picture of Julie, which you've probably seen if you've been following on Instagram or on the page. Uh, it's been going on for quite a while. It's had quite a transition. Um, initially, her well, when I came back to the painting, her arm was up here somewhere, which is way too short. Couldn't possibly be an elbow here. So I had to drop it down, and there was a horse sitting on a hand, which was up here somewhere, which had to drop down also. So there was quite a lot of adjustment. The crossroads in the background, that's changed. Um, so I've kind of been working through the picture stage by stage. Um, the colour of the hands I had, as well, from this one and that one. Um, the colour of the hands were all different to the colour of the face. I kind of worked it only in bits, but not collectively and, it, and it kind of that period of time away from the painting 
made me really see a lot of the errors I was making in, in the work. I was kind of rushing to do everything, I was kind of all fired up and painting bits that were good and bits were a bit sloppy and there was no cohesiveness to it and there was lots of things wrong with the composition. So it's kind of slowed me down and made me look at the work in a new aspect and start to change and rectify it. So we all have that problem is um, once you're painting something you kind of like, if it's in the wrong place you don't want to change it and you'll kind of make excuses for it. I kind of went, nope, that's not good enough. I have to change the things that are wrong. And that's a part of, uh, I think, every artist's uh, process. Um, they have to be brave sometimes to change things or to start again or turn over a page and reapply what you've learned. You know, mistakes are a natural part of the process of painting where you put a colour on and it's not quite right, that you take it off and you put another colour on that which was right. Um, because you, you, you've got a, a kind of a goal that you're trying to reach for. It's not formulated into its finished, rendered thing. It's kind of ethereal in the back of your head, and you're trying to curate your artwork to get to that place. Sometimes you do, and it's great, and it works fine. And sometimes you have to really be tenacious and be dogmatic with it and struggle through the process so this is where we got to the other issue i had with this picture is this umbrella that i've got is a kind of a it's a lace umbrella but it's kind of illuminated from the inside so it's going to cast a lot of light onto the figure and the hands and things but i needed to know where these things were before i started changing the light also the intensity of the light will have an effect on my head so i kind of really made things hard for myself doing this um We've got Steve, Steve Weirdo joined us. Steve, Steve the Weirdo? Steve the Weirdo joined us on this one. So with this, um, I made a lot of fundamental issues in the initial part of the drawing, of the painting. The drawing that I'm talking about I did with Damien last week. Um, with this one, there was problems, but I just painted it. And it's caused me problems through it, and I've had to try and solve those issues and change the thing. So one of the aspects of it was the umbrella that I had had some nice elements to it, but it wasn't quite right. It was kind of rushed and a bit sloppy looking. So I've had to kind of refine it. So I've taken it back to its basic structure again and gone back to the form of that lace umbrella. Uh, Jill, hello, Jill. Good to see you. Um, so got quite a few people joining us on there. Instagram, Instagram guys if you're over on Facebook YouTube and Twitch if you're kind of sitting in the background you can just say hello so I know you're there um, if you have got any questions at all you can ask away please do feel free um, if you're just interested in art and you don't know how to commission artists we can talk about that as well because everybody's got a slightly different process and you might feel a bit disconcerted about how you would go around gaining a commission we can talk about that as well um so every artist has a different process and a different um business model for their commissions um so for some people it's about the pure communication and conversation with the person who's commissioning it so they understand what it is the artist can actually produce some people just produce almost on a product base to say uh, I want a picture of my cat and uh, I, I want it to look like this and the artist might be a landscape painter and it's not within their remit and it takes them out of their comfort zone and they feel kind of it's very difficult to say that I, I can't do this because it's not my thing um, and it don't embarrass people so it's kind of maybe helping people out to try and find the best way to go around commissioning um, and also contacting artists and talking to them about their artwork and then purchasing it that way um, because it's a bit of a it, it's, it's not an everyday occurrence it is a, a luxury item um, and it's not something you would necessarily pop down to Tesco's and buy. There are plenty of department stores that have artwork on the walls which you can buy, which are prints and stuff. But if there's something special that you like and you want to try and get, how do you go around that process? Um, working in galleries, how you know, it can be a, a, a more formal place to kind of shop for your art, if you like. Um, 
But often, but often people think, oh, oh I'll quickly around that, I'll get it cheaper if I get from the artist. I'll circumvent the gallery and go to the artist. It's not necessarily like that if you work on a professional basis. If you're represented by a gallery, what will happen is uh, the artist will then direct you back to the gallery because I have a working relationship with them. And there's a, f a fairness to it, to the business. They're if you are working with a gallery and representing you and promoting you, if a good gallery is promoting your artwork for you, um, you do want to break that. And there's a trust. And so you'll find some artists just go, look, I don't sell personally, I only sell some galleries, I don't feel comfortable you know, dealing with the general public, I just like doing my artwork and showing it that way. Other artists are different. Um, some people have their own websites online that are quite well produced and made and make it very effortless and it's quite clear about sort of shipping costs and things like that because not necessarily all artists are in the same part of the world as you would be. Um, it can be an indicator that if, you, if the artist is in your area and you want to go and see the artwork before you purchase it. Um, you can do this online as well, especially now with all the things like cameras and social media and stuff and Zoom rooms and private conversations or messengers and things like that, where you can have a, a really not good now, better one-to-one -one communication with the artist. So you can introduce yourself, say hello, I'm really interested in your work, I really like a particular piece, um, I want to know more about it, I want to know more about you, the artist, and that's what I found generally, that people are not just buying images, they're buying the story and the um, uh, the artist the creative process behind the artwork as well, and they want to know the artist. So um, there's that process as well. Uh, and never feel fear of just sending them a DM, a private message on Messenger um, to get in contact with them. And because again, we're not very good as I don't think we have been in the past. We're getting better uh, to communicate about our art and to show that we're just normal people just like everybody else we're not anything special and so to talk about the artwork people think oh i need to know about art before i can talk about it and i don't upset the artist because it might be temperamental some artists are temperamental but the majority of us are just normal where we're just doing it a particular thing so no question is generally off the table when you're purchasing. You are the customer at the end of the day. You're the person interested in the art and you're a patron to the arts and it's important because it's how we will make a living as artists and that's not necessarily talked about an awful lot I don't think for the general public to be engaged with artists and buying artwork and to make it a normal occurrence rather than this rarefied special thing. Um, there's a fear of embarrassment I think where the artist is in is fearful of embarrassing the potential buyer and turning them away from their artwork if they um, say how much their artwork is and it's too much for them. There's a, a clarity, a transparency which needs to be curated I think and we are getting better at that. Um, as there are certain restrictions over things like social media so you won't necessarily see people posting up I've done this painting and it's X amount money please send it here there's uh, limitations on what you can do to sell your artwork um, I know Facebook were trying to develop a shop it's not available in the UK I think it's starting to be available now in the States where you can literally put your artwork on there and say it's a particular price um, but certainly yeah talk to them first uh, and I always, always kind of suggest that anyway that if you are interested in the artwork talk to the artist um, because, because they'll, they'll, be they'll be encouraged, <laughs> firstly, and, and flattered that it's somebody showing that level of interest in sort of work. Um, but it's not necessarily all about the sale either. For, the, for most artists, it's about creating the artwork, and the sales is the facilitator of their business. Um, but they did, most artists are not producing artwork for the cash. And I think this fear of the monetary side of it is that you devalue the art if you're selling art and you've sold out. Uh, that's a kind of a real, kind of really bad art school uh, attitude, I think. Because uh, the purity of the artist can't, can't possibly be talking about the financial side of it. But the fact is, if you're dealing with a professional artist, they make a living from producing their artwork. Some artists diversify, like I do. I teach, 
uh, in an art centre and I also work in a school as an art technician and I do um, extras work on movies and films and stuff to bring the revenue in. So not every day am I selling a piece of artwork, but I do make sales from artwork. I work with Satchi Art because uh, I found it is an easy platform. They take less commission and they have a wider network of, of potential customers than say a bricks and mortar gallery would have. Um, not to say there's anything wrong with bricks and mortar galleries, but when I talk about bricks and mortar galleries, I'm talking about the galleries that you'd find on the high street. Um, if you've got a good gallery, they will promote your artwork and sell both the artwork that you've given to them to sell, but they'll sell you as well. And they'll, they'll curate and help develop you as an artist. They'll give you feedback, much needed feedback on, on your artwork, a direction in which you're going, an understanding. Exhibitions where it's purely focused about your artwork and getting across and communicating the art of what the artwork's about. They're doing it online now. Uh, they're making YouTube videos. They're promoting it outside of waiting for somebody to walk past the window, see a picture and go, oh, like that, might go in and buy it. That's maybe the older model. They may have had a stable of uh, potential uh, buyers that they would have curated over a long period of time. Um, and good galleries work hard. So if you find a good gallery as an artist, you kind of you're really happy because that's somebody who's going to look after your work. With the invent of social media and websites and things like that, it's made it much easier for artists to do some of that for themselves and curating their place in the marketplace. You know, if they find other artists and, and online galleries outlets that um, are more specific to their type of work so as a as a as a potential buyer if you're just going to any old gallery to try and find a particular piece of say for example you like portraiture um and you just go to any old gallery going have you got any portraiture um you, you're going to find that sometimes you're going to get no's and it, it, they'll, they'll kind of be showing you stuff that you don't like and it's how you can now start to curate yourself when you're looking through Instagram and you start following people you start to get feeds or fed through artworks that you that are, is more tuned to your tastes so it's become much more personal individual and much more effective that you can start to curate the potential artists that you might want to buy into both financially and also artistically as well um, a lot of artists now are doing little kind of snippets on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitch and they're doing sort of live streams or they'll be showing you a work in progress so you can see the nuts and bolts then the work and the level of ideas that go into creating an artwork and the length of time that that takes. Um, it's not necessarily to say as well that art is uh, more expensive because it takes longer or is more expensive because it's big and small is cheap. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that. There is, there is a formula that some artists use uh, about paying themselves uh, a price per square inch, which overall then works out to be a certain price. But it's a subjective thing, and everybody's doing it slightly differently. And I think this is where the uncomfortability of um, understanding what the price will be you know, it's not like a tin of beans, you go to the shop, the tin of beans is always the same price every week and sometimes there's a special offer on, two for one, three for two. Um, with artwork it's slightly different, you're buying the experience of the artist, the um, hereditary of the artist, the length of time that they've studied, where they've shown, the professionalism. You know, if you've shown somebody who, if you're buying from artwork from people who have um, become more established and, and had big, big exhibitions in well-established well uh, places like, I don't know, the Tate Modern or if you, you know, a museum or something like that, you know that their artwork has reached, attained a certain level, that they're not necessarily doing artwork for a couple of quid. Um, there are lots of people starting out and if you're kind of just starting off yourself, uh, you might want to support local artists who have 
produce work that you kind of like. It might not be the best artwork in the entire world, but it, you're comfortable with it. And that's fine. And you might find that their prices are a lot more to suit your budget. So it's understanding what it is you're looking for, what your budgetary guide is. You can find artists out there that will produce the work that you like, you're just not necessarily in the same budget. Um, or their experience as an artist, you know, it might be that they're just a hobbyist and they're kind of doing it on the side and there's no longevity, like a, a concentrated art career that they are doing other stuff. So it can be a bit hit and miss and, you know, are you buying the artwork or are you buying into the artists and the artwork as an investment for the future and understanding of the growth of that artist is going to be continuing to paint and do and create well what works ongoing from there and you can see the value in your artwork not just uh, monetarily but artistically has a greater importance um if you're looking for a straight commission you want to um, paint get your dog painted <laughs> that's fine there's plenty of artists out there who are doing that as well um but look, but look for artists who are producing, producing that, or, or a particular, if you've got um, a, good a good idea that you haven't, you haven't seen expressed anywhere, and you, and you like certain aspects of certain, say, the way people use colour, or the way people use composition, or the way you have the way of use of the imagination, and you've got an idea that you can't um, see anywhere else, that's when it comes down to the commission process, and it starts with a conversation. So, um, yeah, it wasn't really going to be, <laughs> I hadn't had that in my head to talk about today, but if you've got any questions on that type of thing, ask away. If you're an artist and you're unsure about how to uh, deal with commissions um, or issues and problems that you may have had through commissions, we've all been there. Um, and I think the sort of standard practice now is when you have talked it with through with your client, about what it is they want and you've worked out um, prices and time scales as well um, it's like anything else if you commission from a private individual or co corporate business is that there's an expectation now where you pay at least 50 percent upfront which is non-refundable and the reason being is an awful lot of artists are caught out where they will engage with the artwork, they'll spend time, they'll put their own artwork aside to do the commission. They'll be working away at it, and then the client changes their mind. Now you will find with some artists, if they have that communication, they'll be quite happy to refund the money, but that's on a personal, individual level. It depends on the communication you have with your artist. Um, Say, for example, your house is flooded and you know, artists are human beings. They'll go, oh, listen, I fully understand that. This is out of your control. I will give this back to you. I understand why you can't go ahead with the commission. Some artists are generally like that. If you spent a long time curating the artwork and putting an awful lot of entry money into it yourself, not just the materials, but your time, you need, you need to recoup that back as, uh, as an individual. So, um, nine times out of ten, you'll find artists asking for a fifty percent upfront and the rest on completion. But they will keep good artists keep you informed about every step of the way, every process. They'll be talking to you. This is what I've been working on at the moment. I've been kind of doing this and it's developing. Um, but there's a balance to being involved and kind of trying to hold the brush of the artist as well. This is where it kind of gets a bit muddy. Um, where the initial stages of this painting have been all over the place and it's starting to be refined. Now it's not for a commission, this is for a series of work that um, hopefully will be exhibiting together. It's a different thing than making artwork just to sell. Um, it will be available when they're finished but um, it's bit, this is more important for me to do the artwork to feed my artistic side of it. Off the back of it, commissions come through because they've seen this particular artwork and have a conversation with me and that might open up a different revenue. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to actually seeing the artwork and talking with your artist, make sure you've got a personal connection to them, that you've got how good are they at communicating or getting back to you. You know, if they're in a different 
side of the world, uh, doing a different country, uh, understanding time zones and things like that. But if you send them a text and they haven't said, replied back to you in five minutes, they might be asleep. Uh, and it's little things like that which we need to kind of understand. Um, the other thing is a little bit as well about shipping. You know, it's not cheap to move things across the planet. Um, so it's to understand how much that is and who's taking care of that. Is it involved in the entire price or is it something that's added extra? Um, can you go around and pick it up yourself? Uh, COVID, you know, and any number of things. So if you're talking about... Um, Commission and artworks, it's not, it's not a scary thing. It's a, bit it's a bit like buying a house. You want to go around and see the house, you want to have a walk around it, you want to see what the areas are like, maybe what the schools are like, what it's close to, what the crime rate's like, and all the rest of it. You put a little bit of work into it. And uh, the same be for a car, and the same thing would be for an artwork as well. If it's something you're wanting, you're going to spend the rest of your life with it. Be involved. You know. And ask the artist, talk to them. Uh, if there's artworks on there, leave comments on the artworks that uh, are building that communication up. You might find a piece particularly of artwork which you absolutely love and want to buy, and that's actually commissioned for somebody else. Well, then, is a possibility of you commissioning another artwork which might be different, but will have some of the qualities of what the artist produces. Um, so that's the type of thing I was uh, talking about. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions, um, I put posts up there. I've been painting, as you see it there on screen, the horse in the hand. Now I painted it. Um, it's not a big blob of black paint. Uh, I actually oiled this out the other day. So where I had, um, I'd been painting it over a period of time. Some of the paint had kind of absorbed the oils, and it had become quite matte on the surface. So last week I basically oiled out and oiled over the um, entire picture to reintroduce the oil to reawaken the, the surface and to see the colours as well, which really, really helped. I let that sit for a couple of days and absorb and then I went back into working it. Um, but even now with this, because some colours will absorb oil a little bit quicker than others, which means they dry faster, but it also means they mat down an awful lot. At the, At the end of it, when you varnish it, that's when you get a, um, a more a consistent uh, sheen, if you like, and a consistent uh, colour base. Um, if you to leave it unvarnished over a particular time, you might find that some areas of the painting are quite slick and glossy, and others areas quite matte. Sometimes artists do this on purpose to create the illusion of uh, a featured point or point of focus, and they will push a matte back into a background or you know, so they can create a, a sense of depth um, but for this I needed to oil out so I could see the picture again and I oiled out and I started to rework this horse that's sitting in her hand I started to work on some of the structures of her hand this is kind of still unpainted well it's not so unpainted but it's in its basic form at the moment and similarly with this hand I've had to restructure certain things especially when it comes to this umbrella because she's holding on to it so the angle of the brolly handle itself has to follow the angle of the the shaft of the, the the, the umbrella um, and I noticed that this shaft of the umbrella is actually positioned wrongly so it has to tilt a little bit to come out up here whereas it was shooting out through the top just off to the left so it's all these little things I've kind of had to tweak and move along now if I'd spent time observing what I was doing back when I started this two years ago I could have rectified these problems back in its drawing stages so it can show you the importance of developing your drawing or developing your painting from the early stages to answer some of the issues and to save you a lot of time painting. It's not necessarily about speed but the um, efficiency of painting. You don't want to get caught out painting something or reworking it, painting something, reworking it, painting something, reworking it and not understanding why it's not working. To make myself more efficient I've had to kind of really take a step back and go through a process of breaking down of what is not right or what is working with the picture and to curate the outcome. Sometimes you can plan these things in sketchbooks and in photoshops and lots of different areas but it's not until you go to the act of physically putting it on the canvas, especially with something like this size, this is a metre square. 
But some of the compositional set elements which look okay or look good in on a screen or look good in your sketchbook don't quite work in scale when you scale them up. You suddenly realize there's so much more information that you're going to need to put in because of its size and format and little choices that you need to make along the way. Um, you can do little code studies, but when you go into actually physically painting it, there's nuanced elements to it as well that you need to kind of refine and develop. Um, so that it keeps the painting alive for the artist doing it as well, it keeps you engaged. Uh, but there is a, a balance to becoming efficient and not just repainting and repainting and repainting and repainting. I've done that a lot with this painting. This painting is very, very important for that because it's taught me an awful lot. Uh, and I am that kind of dog with a bone that I'm not just going to give it up and not bother painting it. I actually want to get the painting done because it's an image of my head. It's also part of the whole mammalian um, uh, series of work. So it's an important piece. And if I had not bothered finishing it or just set aside and went oh, I just won't bother doing that one I would have been frustrated by it and that would have affected me in a different way which would have been more um, more frustrating and would have left me with a sense of well we can talk about failures that um, yes I failed because I put the arm in the wrong position and the umbrella wasn't quite right and the face was wrong and the hands were wrong and blah blah blah. You could look at that as being a failure, but I just see that as a development issue. Um, so it's how you approach areas in your work which need refining and developing. And it's not to say that when I finish this, this will be the best painting I will ever paint, but it's an important one because it's taught me an awful lot about where I should be concentrating on as I'm painting. There was another painting I did a while back as well of uh, a friend holding an orangutan. And again, that got to a similar drawing stage as the one uh, that I just did of Damien. Um, but it wasn't fully understood in its drawing, and it did cause me issues when I started to paint it. It was like the suit of armour, so there's certain things there that I know I've had my time again, as it's this stage now, and I was setting it out, there'd be things I would have corrected. But I decided to leave that, I carried on painting it, but I left that one to the stage, so it shows a kind of development in the painting. The one I have behind me here, um, on this canvas just behind me, was a lot more successful. There's lots of areas now that I could, you know, carry on and tweak till the cows come home. Um, but I think it's also important to progress onto the next picture, to, because one thing, it shows you a development, it builds a curation into the story of the whole concept and the whole series of work where the initial painting is so often very much different to the last one in the series and it shows a, a maturing of process or artistic talent. You know, I'm a better painter now than I was when I started this painting two years ago uh, and hopefully in two years I'll be a better painter again. So. It's um, interesting to see when you scroll through and you see an image of an, art, an artwork that you like on Instagram, for example, or Facebook or wherever, and you go to that person's art page, scroll down, keep scrolling until you come to the very first couple of images that they put up, and you will see a marked difference of where they were and how they've slowly progressed. It's not to say that the initial works were bad. But you'll see there'll be different qualities to them, and the focus of the artist and how they transition and move what becomes more important to them artistically start to show in the collection of works. That's what's interesting about art. What it means to you is important, uh, what it makes you feel like, or understand the world in a different way, or um, how it can evoke emotion, or how it can evoke thought. All powerful, All powerful things. It's something that music does an awful lot, and we're quite. Um, tuned uh, to, music. to music because if we hear a, a piece of music and we start tapping our foot and we know it's got a beat that we like or a particular uh, genre of music um, that we've grown up with it might take you back to a memory and things like that our work is the same but we don't have that immediacy to it it's becoming a little bit more easily accessible because of things like Instagram Facebook Twitch and social media whereas before you would have had been removed from it because it would have been a gallery it would have been an event to go to where now it's much more easily accessible. So I'm fa thankful for that aspect because it's built up the communication a little bit better. 
I think, personally. personally. If, you if you disagree or have a thought or have a question about it, please feel free to stick it in the text or if you're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, feel free to drop your own little comment in. Um, also, likewise, uh, on Instagram. We've got a couple of other people there. Jesse... Jesse Tam Tabani, lovely name. You just joined us. Uh, you see the lady? Hello, good to see you. Uh, Moments in Brushworks and Tonics Warrior. Hi. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do a little bit of musing, chatting, talking, and going to do a little bit of working as well. I was kind of work out the overall composition. I've got my reference as well of my lacy umbrella. I'm not going to work, I'm using that as more of a guide than I am working it from. Uh, oh, oh, like a photographic reference that I'm taking that umbrella and putting it into this picture. Uh, but I'm taking some of the structures, elements of a of a, a lacy, uh, was it parasol? Um, from that. So I see I've left this the shaft in, even though it's wrong, because I want to get the the body of the umbrella right first. Once I get the body of the umbrella right first, I'll understand where the centre point is in the brolly that I can then match that up with a hand and then that will give me an axis to put the shaft, shaft of the umbrella in if that makes sense. Uh, this was kind of mapped out with a basic laziness to it before but it kind of stopped. So I've painted over that a little bit um, just with a basic colour. As I said this is going to be a lot lighter inside. It's going to be like there's a light bulb in there which is shining almost like a protection bubble of light over her. Um, so, so it'll be lighter inside and then the light will diffuse as it gets towards the edges of the umbrella so this area here um, will be a lot lighter than this area here because it's going to be further away um, I was thinking about the three-dimensional structure of it so when I'm painting something I think about the three-dimensional form the depth of something, how light moves away, how I want it, that light to move away. None of these things really exist, so it is my imagination, but there's a certain amount of reality-based things in there. If I made the umbrella canopy and I had the shafted umbrella going off this way, it would look weird. So there's a truth to this object that I've, I'm curating that I want to kind of keep truthful to. Um, I was looking at how other artists paint lace, um, there's a, an artist called uh, Shana Levison and she paints herself figuratively wearing uh, this uh, like a lace dress and I was looking at some of her work in progress videos and looking at some of the qualities of that and thought there's lots of elements in there which I can take from I'm not copying her but I'm using her as a reference to understanding maybe how to, to render some of these things but I understand that first before I do any of that, before I get stuck into doing the wonderful uh, intricate detailing of, of all the different colour shifts and changes which are really subtle, I need to understand the structure of it and I need to understand the structure of the lace on it and that first of all starts with the shape and the basic format. So understanding that this is towards you but it's further up because we're kind of looking from this direction up into the uh, into the picture that although this is the leading edge and this is the closest thing to us I'm going to get detail going in and around so this area of the back of the umbrella comes right over the top there's a curve to it so I've, I'm kind of trying to find the structural lines to it so I'm very lightly like drawing sketching in just the functionality of this whole whole thing at the moment. Yeah, uh, who's got join us? Hi, Yun Jan. Danny. Hi. So yeah, we're just talking about um, talking about quite a few things today. Talking about commissioning artists and, and artists commissioning, being commissioned. Um, and this brolly, which has been uh, overpainted and repainted again. So what that I noticed there was like on, on my reference, I've got like a band of these dark lines that. Are not on the edge necessarily straight away, but they start off. Um, just kind of mirroring the outline of that umbrella. So there's no point in me 
stick it in a different arc if it needs to follow this arc here. Also these lines that I've put in come out. They come out a little bit further than I initially had them in my original painting because these are the kind of the, uh, the struts of the umbrella that uh, go past the edge of the umbrella like the little the bits that stick in your eye when you're walking past somebody on a rainy day down the street um, they have a bend to them which has to follow the arc of the umbrella and meet somewhere at the top and I think this one goes up a little bit more than I had it I've got that one kind of map there it goes up here anything I'm putting down here I can move I'm not I'm painting with a very thin solution of paint and um, Although I'm using a, I'm using an ivory black, which is kind of a translucency to it anyway. That all the colours I'll put over the top of this as I start to paint it, that I can. This is literally just drawing out where things are. So, um, as that line comes to that edge, it's going to then start to come out and follow the axis of that arc going around so it's a bit like working out the perspective of it and that's not a scary thing a lot of people get freaked out by the perspective of things and I'd say don't it's just uh, lines and shapes and that's what I'm thinking of but I want those lines and shapes to be truthful to the, um, the, form the form that I'm creating. If I start, if I start not really, not really thinking it, about it, no, I don't really think about the ellipse, or I don't really start thinking about the roundness of the umbrella. Imagine that the umbrella is round. We looked at it from an aerial point of view, and I'm looking at it from that point of view. So, um, you see that that sort of point of view. So. I've got a, a circular ellipse and it has to have that solidity to it as, it, as the canopy goes over the, the top of it so how am I going to create that um, so I was looking at different uh, lace umbrellas it's amazing when you you're working on a piece of work how um, how varied your knowledge becomes because you start to look at lots of different stuff that you never thought you did but you have any particular interest in but then you, then you find yourself looking at spending, spending hours, hours looking at lace umbrellas <laughs> and see the different patterns and textures that might be created through them. So, so this little band edge is a kind of a structural line to the lace. Um, I notice as well that it's not flat between the these kind of struts that come down it's not a flat piece of material it's slightly sunk or it's slightly bowed and that affects light and that's one of the things that when you're researching something you start to really see how things are constructed and it helps you render them better it helps you paint them because you understand the form and the shape and how light will hit it and how light will pass over it and how that will affect colors um, but the, but the beginning part of it is structure, so that's what I'm working on today. So imagine in that band, even though this is in the dark, slightly oily solution there, I'm going to do the same thing over the top of here as well. Over the top. Because how that light is going to kind of diffuse through the canopy a little bit. Um, and this is kind of one of the heavier structural lines of the lace. So how that... It kind of dips into where that strut is. And as it comes out over the top, I need to follow the same di distance from the edge. Follow the arc and down to the next strut so 
and there's a slight sheen on the on the paint so it's helping me see it but we're not really affecting the colors you're probably not going to get the best view of this today unfortunately um and again if i just sort of zoom that in a little bit hopefully you guys can see that on youtube twitch facebook sadly with instagram i can't zoom you in and out um one of the limitations uh, maybe we'll figure it out in future developments um So yeah, how that bends across that arc. So some, so some of these arcs look longer, but only because of their perspective. Some of them are shorter. I've kind of been looking forward to paint this as well. Um, I'm kind of bopping backwards and forwards to drawing elements of the face and the hand. I'm kind of working on lots of different elements of the picture collectively so I can get uh, a more cohesive of a feeling to the painting. Um, sorry, my monitor was about to switch off there. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of working out some of the... Um, issues in the painting collectively so as I paint one thing it has an effect on the other and so for example how the light will come out of here will affect her head but I need to get the structure of her head right uh, I've worked out some colors of her face that are quite generic so I can do, do the same for each of the hands I need to find out where the position of the horse was to get the hand in the right place all of these little elements have a knock-on effect and I want the light to be collectively the same she's going to be feeling slightly more illuminated in this space almost like she's protected by this light so it's not necessarily that she is going to be truthfully lit in this environment this environment obviously is purely imagination it's a generic um, landscape it's crossroads um, we've got a dark sky with a breaking light coming over the horizon fading into the darkness um, so there's lots of elements within this which if you had in reality and you'd set a model in a landscape holding an umbrella which was lit from the inside it would look different but i'm aware of that i'm actually curating it to be a particular painting so i'm making choices and if i'm happy about those choices that's fine there's no argument to that i've done them for a reason if i'm not aware of them and I paint something too light and this is a bit dark and this is a bit kind of mid-tone and I'm not too sure why it can start to look a bit clumsy but if you're curating it you can stand back from a picture and put your hand on your heart and go I did that and I did it for a reason and I think that's a level of integrity that most artists are trying to attain there's an honesty with the work and it's something to look for as well if you're looking things about commissioning artwork from people look for that integrity listen to how they talk about their work you know um see, see their work so you can see if the level of uh, experience and knowledge has been curated in a particular way to give us a particular art form it's not, I'm not talking necessarily about realism uh, you can find the same thing with abstract painters and expressionists and all the rest of the different isms look for the integrity behind the work what was their goal how did they go through their process did they achieve the outcome in the end was it something that they are building upon as an artist and that's something you can make uh, a selective judgment on if those things are all kind of ticking yes to you and you really like their artwork and you want to buy it go for it if you've got somebody who's a bit flaky because there are people out there who not necessarily have quite understood to kind of get a feeling what they think artists now i'm going to do that um and it becomes like a a process without any soul to it you're gonna find the artwork could be a bit flat not necessarily for one one or two particular images might be fine visually they might be quite interesting to look at but collectively over a period of years if that artist doesn't engage themselves with their artwork their artwork won't progress their artwork will be stagnant it'll be flat and say for example i've said this before if you're if if everybody's buying pictures of dogs and they start painting pictures of dogs 
as if they're, if they're constantly chasing that sale, they're not actually chasing their own artistic journey. And I don't want to use that kind of journey word too much, but um, there's a, there is a, a growth of an artist painting and sculpting and drawing that you can see the refinement and the choices and the, the intelligent thought processes behind a work. That makes it really interesting. That's like even more to your artwork. There's more life behind it. It's not just the superficial image that you might scroll past on Instagram. There's an awful lot more content behind it as well. And when you own a piece of work like that, you'll start to appreciate it. You see it every day. And you it becomes more than just a picture, a visual image. It becomes something else. And if the artist has that integrity, that's one of the things I would suggest looking for. What what answers your questions uh, about integrity and look for those things in your artists that you want to buy from. There you go. Uh, uh, Leslie Tommy, uh, you said you just sent a request to join my live uh, video. Uh, you're here. If you do want to join any of the videos, please send me a DM. Uh, more than happy to chat with other artists online and have a conversation with you. Uh, but we'll have a little brief conversation first and we'll go from there. Uh, but probably not today. So that's okay. Uh, so, yeah, if, as I said before, if you've got any questions, ask away. Um, doesn't look like, like I always find out that I chat a hell of a lot more than I actually paint. That's why I put up a kind of my little real videos up of me doing a painting or a bit that I've just finished. Because uh, I think I, I certainly enjoy seeing the process of other artists' work. Um, and seeing how their artwork develops. And occasionally the, you just see a, an artwork put up, but you have more of an understanding about how all of the work's going to be, if you've seen sort of uh, work in progress videos. Not that, you know, I don't do work for Instagram. <laughs> There's something that's been kind of cropping up lately where it seems to be feeding the beast rather than feeding the art. The art. And I do my artwork anyway. It's just an additional bit. Of, I see it as fun. I don't even see it as work. I do stuff on social media. I'm social. You're just being nice to people. I mean, if you walk down the street and you're chatting about your artwork, you'd you'd show it. So there's no different on a on a live stream or in your profile. You know, showing your artwork that way. I don't necessarily worry about numbers of likes and the numbers of people who follow the page. It's interesting to see the insights and the, to see the demographics and stuff. Um, so it's interesting from the point of view that you get to see that there's people from all over the world who get in contact with you and see your artwork and send messages and buy work and things. Um, when, this when this one comes out, I've just noticed, can you see that there? Again, this is very dark and it's probably not the best thing to paint uh, as, a, as a demonstration. But this, as this comes around, and this comes out that front, it arcs. And then that one arcs back. That's there. That one was there. There's a shallowing of the next line up. So, how these lines are just set flat, quite equidistant apart, as it, as it starts to bend around a corner, it's going to naturally get narrower. So, for example, where that line was here, this one is going to be slightly narrower above it, but as it comes out, widens. And again, as it comes down, it's going to slightly widen again. Every 
every artist, every artist is different. different. Every art, you know, sort of develops and finds their own practice. Might have gone through a specific. Um, oh, that was a lovely summary of artist's journey. Oh, what painting? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, city, what I think. Um, I've been listening to so many different podcasts and streams and listening to different artists talk. And they're, and they're all different, different. And, they all and they all have, have different, different art backgrounds, backgrounds and art training. training. But the ones I really, really, really like are the ones that have integrity about the artwork process. and the process and their passion for what they do. And it comes through and it infuses everything. Um, not just their imagery that they do, but the how how they paint. You know, the careful curation and, and um, investigation and experimentation and trial and error I was sort of saying about before the PC is failure it's you know it's you're not going to get everything right all of the time nobody does you know even professional artists hit a bum note when they're did a, given a gig to say 10,000 people apart from Prince I did see Prince once he never hit a bum note uh, <laughs> but without it's okay, like you see them you know, put a paint and go oh, God, it's the wrong colour <laughs> or you know as they kind of sketch out oh, some artists have a beautiful technical clarity to what they do and they're very methodical um i'm more sculptural i'm messy and i like figuring things out and pushing things around until they get into the right place it takes me longer i i do it's masochistic but I quite enjoy that kind of investigatory kind of finding your way through an artwork um it keeps it, keeps it alive for me you know, you know, there have been times, times that I've drawn a picture and it looked, it felt like it just fell off, fell off the pencil. And I've sat back and gone, wow, that really worked. Then the image is really good, and I can't remember working on it because everything worked well. Great, you know, if I do more, I should become more proficient, and I should um, not have so much uh, questioning to do. But in things like when you're painting, you're making decisions all of the time. Where does that shadow go? How far is that? Far away from that? You know. Um, what shape, what shape is this? What tone, what tone is this? How does that tone shift from dark to light? All those elements. Um, do I want something to disappear into the background? Do I want something to, to be clinically sharp and right in the front? Do I, what type of mood do I want for the picture? All those different types of things that you're trying to curate is more than just a technique, it's the artistry. So there's a balance between these two things. Yes, there might be a specific technical way of doing something better, but artistically, is that going to help you? If it, is, if it is, do it. If it doesn't, don't do it. You might need to find another way. And that's the development of art history, you know, artists finding their own way of exploring and expressing themselves. It's not just about pure expression. There has to be some balance through the technical side of it as well. Oh, Angela. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> just joined us. So, yeah, uh, today working on this, probably. Uh, we've been talking about commissioning artists as well. Uh, about like how you go through that process is it uh, more complicated than it needs to be um, or have we got better at it I think some artists are doing it particularly well some artists are very clear about their work and how much it is and where it is you can buy it from and they're not um, I think what they call it on, Inst on YouTube I think they called it shilling uh, where, where they almost, they almost like put an advert in and it's really clunky sometimes, sometimes and they go and this week we're sponsored by blah 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 uh, uh, it's the best coffee in the world blah, 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 blah. and they go on for a, for a spiel that they've done because they've been sponsored by somebody um, and with artists it can feel a bit clunky when they talk about the value of their work about there's artistic value and monetary value but if they're trying to um, sell a picture one it's very difficult to do on social media because there's rules and restrictions involved with it uh, so it creates a vagary about price as well i think um you know uh, where do you price your work at um you know do you move your prices around because of the economic issues that the world might be facing um, and it's down to personal Choice as the artist, I think, as well, um, and generally you can see that in how they do 
conduct themselves uh, in the business of being an artist. And that's another thing to look for if you are commissioning something. Check out the other stuff that they've sold, how they've dealt with people, how they have communicated things. Um, if it's a, a professional basis and people feel comfortable about them, this is a, the price for these works and it's uh, based on uh, a development progression on the experience that the artist has had, uh, the number of sales that have had and the curation of the prices that as they go on the prices may increase. You know, if their prices are going up and down, it becomes a bit worrisome. You know, you wouldn't buy a car like that, you wouldn't buy a house like that. Um, it's been house, my house price crashes, that might not be a good example. But what I mean is, like, if you went out today to buy a car and it was £10,000, and you went out tomorrow and it was a thousand pounds and then the day after it was twenty thousand pounds you go what the hell why is the price is all over the place no this is an investment i don't want to i don't really want to buy something that's that volatile um and i think that's the same thing for art just to be aware of as well if they're trying to chase the market with their prices the, the jerry doesn't work if you've had a consistent uh good grounding in prices to begin with and there's been price uh, an understanding of where, where you've entered the market at, as in your experience and your, the quality of your work. Um, that can rise quite quickly if you make a lot, a lot of sales, as you produce more, you're producing your work, you're not, there's more demand for it, the value of your work can go up. Um, if the artist has gone, no, whatever I produce, this is what the price is going to be because it's how I work my business model, that's fine. Um, but if you yes, say if you find artists kind of lifting and dropping prices to kind of or they're kind of being vague, trying to check out if you've got money, so there might be a bit more. Don't bother buying from them. That, there's a level of integrity there. If the artwork is that price, it is that price, and it's the same price for anybody, whether you've got lots of money or whether you've had to save up for it. You know, the price should be the same. It shouldn't be fluctuating around. It shouldn't be one price for one person, another price for another person. Um, but have a conversation with them, have that dialogue, um, find out what have they sold anywhere else, whereabouts have they sold, uh, have they had exhibitions, what prices were the work, was the work in the exhibitions prior, um, do you research on it, it's part of the interest in, in buying the artwork as well, not on the monetary side of it, but the investigation into what the artists are like and what they're about. Um, some artists have different uh, ranges of work, so I make very inexpensive prints uh, from for my manual range of works, and I wanted them to be inexpensive because I want people to engage with the work and open it up to a broader audience. Now, some people have said to me, well, you shouldn't do that because it devalues the, um, the original artwork itself, and I don't quite see that. Um, the original artwork itself has a different price because it's a different thing. People who are wanting to buy into the artwork might not be able to afford a finished work, so a print version is available as an image, but it's limited as to how many I produce. There's, uh, so you curate your business around uh, different revenue streams. It's not that you're changing the prices of your artwork, you've got prints that are one price, and um, or limited prints might be another price and original artworks might be another price and that's one way of in, in getting into following artwork that you don't necessarily have to buy originals um, but you might be leading your way up to it um, my artwork has been used for lots of different things which I think adds uh, uh, a legacy to an artwork which has a greater value so um, artworks that have been highlighted in articles or interviews or have been in television uh, through competitions and things like that. You can win a competition and the artwork's not for sale at that time, but in 10 years' time it might be worth it, uh, available for, for sale. That Because of that... Um, Legacy it has a story behind it, that provenance starts to build. It adds uh, an intrinsic value to the artwork as well. It becomes, I've had drawings that I've done which have 
had a real significant importance for me as an artist developing, but also a personal importance, and I value that um, in the artwork because it, it's a, of its prominence. Um, it doesn't mean to say that the other artworks done around that time that didn't necessarily have the same story behind it are, are less than, but they just don't have uh, the additional attributes of provenance as well. So, for example, if an artwork they did as a self-portrait that was sold in um, on a TV program called Show Me the Money, which was about how trying to figure out how much your artwork was worth, which is a bit crazy as well. I, cause I, I was just stepping into becoming a professional artist, and I was trying to find out my my value in the art market. I didn't want to price myself too high, and I didn't want to price myself too low. Um, so they made you come in and say how much you thought your artwork was worth. Uh, they judged you on your artwork, whether the artwork could go forward to the exhibition, which was nice, because it wasn't just about money. Um, but, when but when it went forward to the exhibition, it was there were, all the artworks were available for blind bid. You had your price kind of uh, kind of set about what you thought it was, and but you didn't mention it to anybody, um, and then people would bid on your work. And, I had undervalued myself by several hundred pounds, <laughs> and I started to see and understand that I might not sell a piece of work every single day, but I, if I was to undersell myself as well, because you have to take yourself, you have to be honest and important with yourself, if you're underselling yourself and you're doing everything for 50 quid, you're not going to make a living from it. You might be constantly bombarded with doing stuff that you don't want to do. So you have to curate your art side of it. Uh, and there's also value to what you do. And it's not just monetary terms. It, it's, say, for example, if you had a an electrician come around and he said the price of, your, of doing the job for you is this because it's got to be this amount of time. This person is going to be using uh, these materials and it's going to take two men to do this job. Uh, there's a clear sort of price structure. If you were to calculate the amount of hours I've spent on this painting, but where I am value-wise in the art market, I am not producing it on the same way. It's not the same thing. I can't produce like for like. It's not hours and time into a work, therefore it is this price. Because I might have had to work with all those hours to get to the stage of a painting that will help me progress as an artist, but I've had to work longer on it, like the overtime. Um, so working on private commissions is slightly different. Working on your own work, um, I don't think of sales. I don't think of value money-wise. When I've done the work and I've completed it and I step back from it, I have a better... Uh, objective view of the, the work and I can see where its monetary value may lay um, and again where you sell your work that also has another thing if you're selling it through galleries or if you're having a show in a museum and the works are available for sale there might be a commission you need to take that into account if that commission is added on top to your value are you pushing yourself out of your price bracket so you have to kind of marry these things up is it a possibility that you will sell more collectively in an exhibition because the gallery itself has done an awful lot of work to curate a show um, therefore you'll make more sales then all of these things have a have a impact uh, to pricing so it, again I think it's, an, it's one of the subject areas that a lot of us feel comfortable talking about and I don't think necessarily we should um, it's not, it's not to be cocky about things, but if, if I was a plumber, I'd get paid. If I was an electrician, I'd get paid. If I was an artist, I need to get paid. Um, so sometimes you get this as well from people commissioning you that I've found that uh, this is corporate, because I, I do corporate commissions as well, that um, they'll see what special deal they can get from you. And, which is okay. There's always a it's got to be a flexibility to something, 
some things where you go, look, if I, if I can help you out and this is going to seem a that you want me to do this for you, I don't mind being a little bit flexible, but what I'm not going to do is undercut myself. Um, I'm not going to be negotiated down in price, as in it's, uh, you know, or you put your artwork up here for free for us and we'll tell loads of people about it. Well, that's not good for me because uh, I can't eat that. <laughs> you know, you don't go to Tesco's and buy food that way. Oh, you know, let me, you know, just take this food home. I'll cook it and eat it and I'll tell people about it. You know, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Um, which is basically what an awful lot of artists are being subjected to. And that's, that's Im embarrassing for everybody because it's hard for an artist to go, look, I'm just not interested because I there's a value to what you do. There's, there's an eagerness to an awful lot of young artists, I think, to get their artwork out there that will do anything. And sometimes, and sometimes um, you, do you do things for the pure experience of it that are not, don't have monetary value in it, but it's about the experience and gaining experience, and that's understandable and that's fine. But you don't want to set that out to be a business model because you won't make a living from it. Uh, when it comes to pricing, it's not about undercutting everybody else. I've seen that happen as well, where... Um, Oh, look, I, know I know that person said they'd do that dog portrait for you for 200 quid, I'll do it for 50 for you. you it's not about undercutting your, your for fellow artists, but it's of value in respecting your artwork, because that's why I think the value of art in in the general for the general public is very hard to kind of see, because the prices are all over the place. I'm not saying that there should be a price structure for all artists. Um, if you paint one head with two hands, it's this price. Funny enough, that's where it used to be kind of uh, sold, that it, where you commissioned a painter back in the past, they went, well, you know, we're going to have two people, and it's going to be this amount of money. If you want me to do the hands, it's going to be a lot more. Um, if it was, oh, look, he bought a painting, and it had everybody showing their hands. He must have paid a fortune for that. It's not about that side of the monetary side of it. That's crap. It's about, it's about consistency, it's about, it's about integrity, it's about, it's about valuing you, you, you yourself as an artist, but also valuing the artist that you buy from. Um, it's about a longevity. It can be an investment. If you can see the trajectory of an artist and they're on the rise to do something amazing and you found them just at the beginning of their art career, but you have a true belief that this person is going to do something, it might be an investment. Um, I think when it gets into the rarefied air of artworks becoming worth millions and millions and millions of pounds, that's far removed from the artist ever producing it. And to be honest with you, nine times out of ten, the artist will never see any of that money. You know, once you've you've sold that painting once to one person, there is no resale rights, unfortunately. Unfortunately, <laughs> where you're getting paid for everything else above and beyond what that artwork does after. You can, you can hold the copyright to it, it's different. The artwork, the artwork itself, um, it, you won't get value from that back, but where it comes from the copyright side of it, they can't do anything with it. So you can do things with copyright yourself as an artist. And I've copyrighted my image out for, for certain things. So there's a theatre production that was just about to go ahead in Paris Sadly, because of COVID, it was cut short. I'm hopefully they're gonna get it back up and going again. But it was a production of Harvey the Rabbit. It's a theatre production of the 1940s um, film where there's a imaginary rabbit in it. And for the image of that, for their posters that they want to use, was a my self portrait as a rabbit, and I was made up. No, it's not. It's something additional to the artwork. It adds a story extra. Um, when, I when I painted it, or so when I drew it at the time, I didn't draw it for the competition it went into. I drew it for the artwork itself. The competition came around and I thought it might be suitable. I put it in. I didn't know it was going to sell. It helped me find out my initial pricing structure. Um, a celebrity chef bought it. He had it photographed in his uh, London home, uh, which went into the arts and home magazine so more people saw that which brought more people to my door to ask me about my artwork so sometimes artworks have a life of their own 
but you own the copyright to it. So last year, somebody came up to me and went, um, contact me via email. Love your work. We would love to use this image. Had a conversation with them, and I leased the right out for them to do that. And there's plenty of uh, formats you can do that within. You know, a one-off payment, or if they're reproducing it over and over and over again for posters and they're making sales of it, you can take a percentage of that sale. You, but you have that negotiation. So there's a business model head separate to the artist model as you're working on your artwork you have to separate the two do the artwork first and then curate your business as well as you find out a lot of artists will do well um, art agents there's some good art agents out there as well they will help you navigate the world of art um, but they will get a commission from the artist for the sale so something to be aware of uh, and good 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 um, art agents are worth their salt they're good because they curate people and they find opportunities for their artists um, they put you in places that you'd never thought of or had a hope to get into by yourself but if they're curating lots of things together they can help help you that way um, but you as an artist have to build that community that kind of uh, relationship up with them as well what's expected of you what do you expect of them get a contract get a contract if you work with a gallery get a contract there's a lot of things to do with the fact that artists are being screwed over is not having a contract but if you're working on the business side of it you need that uh, Angela you're saying one of your favorite movies of all time was was yeah you love Harvey I, I love that film I absolutely, I absolutely love, love that film. Um, I've, I've got it as well, black the black and white version. I could try and get it. It's actually behind the painting. I've got a little shelf of all my DVDs. I stick movies on sometimes when I watch. Um, and one of the reasons why I started off drawing, a lot of people don't realise this, is because I used to watch an awful lot of black and white films as a kid. On a Saturday morning, um, at least to put on little black and white movies and there'll be some sort of thriller or there'll be a comedy like Harold Lloyd and uh, the Laurel and Hardy films, uh, Buster Keaton, uh, that type of old school comedy type of thing but the uh, 1940s drama um, and film noir kind of movies that they've put on the, the gangster movies of, in America and things like that we're all black and white and when I remember the films back years later I always thought they were in colour because I projected my own colours onto them I had my own kind of palette and thought and then I would see it again and go oh my god that was black and white so one of the reasons why I started early doors doing a lot of monochrome work working in pencil and charcoal was for that effect that it wasn't too that I didn't like colour because I love colour um, it was more to do with the fact it allowed people to breathe their imagination into a picture how they could assign a colour or tone tonal shifts well not necessarily tonal shifts because it's black and white you take care of the tonal shifts but it added a little bit of interest for people to kind of see things into the picture that you haven't created and what I painted uh, a cat once and People contact me going, I, I, I love I loved that ginger tomcat you did, it was beautiful. And they went, how do you know it's ginger? And they went, because... I, I don't know. Is it a ginger cat? And I went, yeah, it is a ginger cat. I don't... There's a, 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 almost a subconscious understanding of what the colour is going to be without after you actually put it in there. So it was one of the reasons why I started working in monochrome and pencils and things. But again, it's not because I don't like colour. So, yes, yeah, bit of a segue. Um, still haven't painted much of this. You might see more posts of it coming up. Uh, we will see more posts of it coming up on Instagram, so check back for that. And I'll give you an update as to where it's got to. <laughs> so this is more about a conversation about art than, than necessarily a demonstration. If, however, there is something you want me to demonstrate <laughs> to answer a physical drawing. Um, I did initially start doing that right about a year ago when I started doing these kind of live broadcasts and I was kind of doing little demonstrations each week and then a follow up and a follow up and a follow up as I was drawing as I did it. Um, I just found sort of the, the chat more interesting for me as well uh, but also the concentration sometimes I'm not 
that skill that I might be look at drawing and talking. I can do a bit of it, but um, I, I muse an awful lot. I cogitate an awful lot. I slow myself down an awful lot when I paint. Um, I'm a little bit quicker when I draw because I've drawn so much. It's a little bit more efficient. Um, but when I'm painting, I am much more, as I say before, sculptural. I'm kind of like, I'll try that. I'll do this. And I'll push the push this way. Is that what? Is that what? Yeah, that's a mark I like to do. I will work out my palette, you know, and I'll mix up my palette and I'll play with that a little bit and I'll look at the colours and go, yeah, that's right, and I'll put it on and it won't be right. So it's a demonstration process. It could be um, bitty. That way. What I'm, what I'm doing today is more drawing, and I should have done an awful lot more of drawing than necessary chatting, but hey, what can you do? Uh, so Catherine Hansen joins you, just hello as well, you just joined us, and Deborah, good to you, you just joined us as well, because Zama, sorry, Kretsch Zama, Kretsch Zama, sorry if I've just ruined, totally not, not pronounced your name right at all, so apologies for that. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions on artwork that you're doing, issues that you're having, um, I'll tell you what I'm doing at the moment, is just working out the structure for this umbrella. I have looked at uh, lots of lace umbrellas, and I started to see the structural elements that I need to put into this so I paint I had painted this before and I've got rid of it uh, what I'm doing now is starting to find the forms of all of these things um, so let me see there is like a little like a leaf pattern this is kind of very sketchy light paint that I'm painting on. Again, this leaf pattern is going to change. It's uh, perspective as it curves around the shape of this ellipse of this one. So this one's flatter and full on. These are going to be slightly narrower because they're off to the side and more side on. So I'm thinking about the kind of Spatial awareness as well. As I refine it, I'm going to have a bit play with the the colours so that the, there'll be a lighter version. A light, it's basically going to be illuminated from inside, so it's going to be lighter here and then diffuse as it comes down here. So the colour changes will be just this one kind of generic blue colour. There'll be a transition, so it's a lot softer. Also, light then pops through. Um, the canopy of the, the umbrella as well, there's light that kind of penetrates through because it's kind of a lacy feel. You can kind of, kind of see through it a little bit. Um, kind of be like a little bit sheer. There'll be elements where you can see the light through there. Uh, which will have to also follow the pattern that I'm, at the moment, trying to figure out and draw into this. Um, this is the second I'm just thinking the centre of that is there, and these fronds of the kind of leaf pattern, they, this bows out this way. Let's see, Let's put this in a little bit this way. If this is the centre, and that centre line, imagine it goes all the way through there. That's the centre there. Uh, I'm, not I'm not looking at the centre of this one, I'm looking at the centre of this pane of the umbrella as it comes back over the top of the umbrella that way. I'm starting to see how that kind of arcs out. So that's the centre there. And That's the centre there. You can see how that's longer on that side and shorter on that side because it's following that form. So I've got to think about the, the structural elements of it. Um, if that 
big sense. You possibly can't see it on Instagram, so I really apologise about that. But hopefully you can see it there on uh, YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. You can start to see how the angles are going to change now as I do this. So if this is a centre line, go up to the centre of this one. And the centre line, go to the centre of that one. It has a slightly different pointier feel to it. The centre line of this goes that way. There's a centre line here, so it's going to be shorter here. And longer here. But I'm finding that centre point of this panel, the centre point of that panel, the centre point of that panel helps me then link up this corner to the centre point as as one of the fronds of the design. Now I'm looking at it's quite a, a focused area of detailing I'm, but I'm not painting detail I'm, I am actually just working out if you actually just asked me a question there about proportions can you give some tips about proportions you know many people use a grid method uh, what about you um, yeah thank you. good question um, I don't tend to use the grid method um, what I'm actually doing now is working out the proportions of the lace that are going to be on the inside of this uh, umbrella um, and I always try and find the big shape first. What is it I'm doing? I mean, in this case, I'm doing an umbrella. So it's a canopy shape. So it's an oval. Oh, sorry, so it's like an ellipse. It's a circular shape uh, that has an ellipse to it. Um, I need the arc of that top curve. I have a center point. I'll find the center point. Now, that center point isn't actually lining up with this uh, umbrella shaft because I've, I've changed the umbrella so I'll repaint that um, and I'm working out where the fronds of this umbrella come out what's the center point because the design actually comes up to the center on both from from both sides of the front so when you're looking at say a uh, head like, like my head now um, and I've got it turned to one side or tilted to one side if you've got the idea of proportions hardwired into your head, how you've studied them, is a face looking straight onto you, and you try to put those ideas of a proportion on a head that's tilted and shifted to one side and lent up to one side. It won't quite work because the eyes won't be in the middle of the head. Um, your head's a round, a three dimensional, well, it's not round, but it's three, a three dimensional shape. Um, how you might sit and push your face up on one side. So you, whatever it is you're painting or drawing, find the big shape of it first. What shape is it? Because my head shape isn't necessarily oval. You know, if you have a look at this shape here, down to the bottom of my chin, up this way, over there, and then back down this way, it's got a bit more of a triangular shape with a curved bit on the top. That's the bigger shape. If I went halfway between my beard and the top of my head, what would I get to? Now, if it's straight on like this, halfway between my chin and the top of my head would be roughly where my eyes would come. But if you're talking about my beard and the top of my head, and it's my head's tilted and shifted, you might get, oh, what do you get? Let me see. Half of that. You get this bit here, which is not my not my uh, eyes, but the part where my glasses would hit my chin. So if I was to take a straight line and draw that straight across, what else do I hit? I hit the tip of my nose. Well, I now know where the tip of my nose is. So all of these things, where you sort of triangulate them, will help you find out your proportions of whatever it is you're drawing. So you never have a problem with drawing any one thing. If you figure out the shape of the thing and draw the angle between the line, when I say angle, I don't mean 3.4 degrees. I mean, literally, you can take a paintbrush and put a pen or a pencil and line it up to see where things line up with. You know, um, if I put my head in this angle 
I align my pencil to the line of how my head is angled. Um, you can see where the pen pencil actually comes out. It's not through the top of my head, but this is where my facial plane is here. Comes out the top of my head. You can see where that lines up there. So you take a straight line from there to there, you get the tip of my nose to that point of my head, which can help you work, work out the curvature of this part of my forehead, because that was in the centre of it. So that's the apex, the top part of that curve. All of these things can start to pull together. And one of the reasons why I don't necessarily use the grid method is one if you're working from a reference um, and you've put your uh, grid over your drawing. Nine times out of ten, where those two lines cross is normally a interesting aspect of the features that you can't quite see because there's a big line across it. Um, if you get one of those lines slightly out of proportion in itself, because basically what you're doing is repeating what I'm talking about for every square. In each square, when you grid out, you're matching up where one line goes and where that shape goes. Well, when you're doing it for the entirety of the big thing, the, you are dealing with one square. So that's one of the reasons why I don't necessarily use it. I have seen people use it particularly well, uh, efficiency speed-wise to figure out where things are. But as you do more of it, you can train your eye to see these things. The difference is, occasionally you don't. Occasionally things will go awry and you need to check yourself, but things will do the same thing in your grid. As soon as you've got your grid down, you've marked everything out and you start painting it, you should, the, the, the grid is useless because you're not gridding. Over, you know, you're not, that grid isn't going to stay there to the end of the painting and then you carefully paint out the grid because it wouldn't work. Um, I'd say gridding out should be there for your initial drawing for a painting or your initial sketch outline and then put it away and then start to train your eye to see the shapes and forms um, you know I've seen uh, landscape artists use it as well in a way uh, they use it in a slightly better way um, they'll get a picture frame and have a stringed grid and they'll place that if the painting on plein air or outside they'll place that so they can curate the composition of what it is they want to paint and then they'll quickly mark out on their canvas or their paper certain key elements of that um, the proportions of their painting and use it that way which is very effective um, so I don't I don't say, say don't use it but use it sparingly try and train your eye to see the big shapes and adjust draw lightly to begin with paint lightly uh, painting and underpainting in first, sketch it out. <coughs> the working drawing or working painting of your of your artwork. Figure the placement of things out first before you get into any detail. Don't start painting in eyelashes and pupils and nostrils. If you don't know where the nose is, don't put a nostril in. Same thing for the eye. If you don't know where the eye is, don't start drawing eyelashes. Yeah, I, know yeah, I know it sounds simple, but it, it's something when we're starting off, it's, we want to kind of rush to get to the juicy bits. When you start to develop as an artist, you start to realise that it's all juicy bits, and it doesn't matter whether it's a flourishing eyelash right at the very end of a painting, or you're starting off sketching out the big shape form. Um, the level of interest is, is still there all the way through. Hopefully, Hopefully that helps. That wasn't a too long-winded way of answering that question. But thank you very much for asking. Really appreciate it. Uh, has, anybody, has anybody got any other questions? You're quite welcome to ask. Let me ask you what you're painting at the minute. Uh, what things have worked well for you? Um, nobody will be quite happy to talk about all of the things that are not going quite so well or cocking up. I talk about it an awful lot in my work, but I will also talk about things that have worked better, like my horse down here. So I can zoom into, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, Twitch and Facebook, um, I'll try and take you a little bit closer shot. But I was really pleased with the horse I did. Um, Purely simply, the horse I had initially I kind of liked, but it was something 
quite, quite not right about the neck on it and it kind of stuck there um, and then where it had to reposition it I had to kind of paint over that one repaint it and it, it looked a bit like a donkey initially uh, with like a big bum and also I had the head turned around in a different angle and it looked a bit uh, like a Great Dane <laughs> it's really weird, Great Dane, donkeyish type of thing, and it just what, what I was I was sketching it out wasn't quite right, and I kind of left it to a stage, um, which I which I think you can actually see on Instagram. If you scroll through my feed on Instagram, you'll you'll see. I think I've said one day sometimes uh, painting is a horse's arse, and the next day you are actually painting your horse's arse. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I've kind of refined that and refined it and refined it down there until I've got the horse I like. So I'm quite happy with that horse. Now we've got to, to kind of paint the rest of the hand to the painting, which is great because I can in, involve the entire thing. That's the part of the process. It, you evolve the entire picture together. It's kind of there's still things to do on it, but I'm not going to do those until I get the rest of the painting to the similar stage. Then I can go back over and through it again and refine it a lot more. So, so Henny Ripplers use it. Thank you, Valve. Thank you so much. Yeah, it helps you a lot. Well, I'm glad, glad it does. That's what our cat is about. Um, other artists are there as well for you. Often come into the chat. The conversation I've had with uh, streaming artwork is great because people start the conversation up themselves and start talking to each other. And um, uh, no one person is an island. I don't. I'm, I don't have all of the knowledge in the world, uh, and every artist I know, so I know some amazing artists, still have that inquisitive nature to them. Still have that kind of wonderlust about finding things out. They may have a practice that they've they've refined over the years and they've become exceptionally good at it, but they're not afraid of change. They're not afraid of pushing things even further, and that's what's interesting. You see, good artists, they don't. They never stagnate. They're not stuck in a rut. They are push themselves. Now, artistically, sometimes you can get a bit flat with the uh, thing that you've done or you've become known for. Um, but you can change it. And some artists find that a difficult process that they have to really work hard to inspire themselves to do something different. It's not change for change's sake, but sometimes change is necessary to progress. Uh, what you do. Uh, some, some artists are happy just maybe sticking with the same subject matter. People might think it's the same thing, but their painting progresses in such a way that it's so subtle that you don't see the change. Um, and the effects that they produce are beautiful. So, yeah, it, it's what I've learned is over the years there's no definitive answer for any one thing. There's lots of different aspects of doing things in art, and I think that's the both the wonderment and the frustration of it. Um, because when we're starting off, we just want to be told, do A, B, and you'll get C. And in certain things, that's right. So certain basic technical things that can be right. But that is just the starting off point. You know, what you do from it, from there is entirely up to you, where you end up doing something that doesn't exist. Julie, Julie never stood at a crossroads carrying a horse or carrying an illuminated umbrella. This is something that has developed through the artistic side, the poetry side, the imaginative, creative side, but it's honed with an awful lot of study that I've done of drawing people's faces from life and from doing from references and making mistakes and pick up all those things. Uh, uh, w is saying, uh, what works for you to deal with artist block? Um, rival, I keep a little sketchbook of, um, and it's not mean sketches, it's just words or stuff that pops in my head. You know, that, like any, if you're doing anything, anything, you're cooking the tea or watching a, your favourite TV programme, and you just be musing about something in the back of your head, a little thought popping, I write it down. Yeah, I've seen other people uh, uh, use it as a dictaphone and put it and just, just say it into their phone, or they just text themselves a message. Um, um, so, so there's like there's a body of work of ideas, of ideas sitting there ready to go at any time. So I'm not stuck for anything to do. Um, enthusiasm to paint or to draw. 
I think can sometimes be blocked externally. Um, you know, you might just be having a difficult, I've had this before, difficult time personally, and your, your focus isn't on artwork at the time, it's on life. And um, there's a frustration that might build up because you're not doing your artwork, but because you're not doing your artwork, you've got to deal with other stuff. I try to, to see it that I can plan ahead, give myself a break to plan ahead that when I do get back, that'll be the right time, and this is what I'm going to do. So I start planning it. So when I go back into the studio to paint, or when I get a chance to go back into the studio and paint, I'm geared up, I'm ready, I'm eager to go. So it's not a... I try to de-escalate the frustration of, say, the particular issue that might be going on at a time um, and, separate and separate it from that should be fun and enjoyment and the love of doing the, the work um, but sometimes life can be harsh uh, some you know and it can take its toll and that's the same for everybody everybody's life's like that um, and it's to allow yourself that time and not pressurize yourself don't beat yourself up that you are not producing 20 portraits a day because some, some days you're going to be prolific and some, and some days you're going to go in the studio and you're going to go it feels like I've never held a paintbrush in my hand before I've had days like that and I've got a splattered paint on the thing and every colour I've put on there has been wrong it's in the wrong place and I goes, what am I doing today ok, tell you what I'll do today I'm going to clean my brushes clean my palette I'll do something technical I'll write some ideas down I will send off that email I will fill in that form and I will Get my, get my camera set up for uh, this on a Saturday. Uh, uh, I make my time, time productive. I might not have actually painted anything, but I've made it easy for myself to paint the next time I go in. Um, um, yeah, but, yeah, but I, if it's about ideas, time, uh, about, you know, <laughs> I've got a mind now that I've kind of trained over a period of time that I can allow to go anywhere and do anything, imaginatively. Give you a subject matter, I'll come up with an idea for it, and I'll come up with a concept for it. It's not that I'm being overly clever, it's just that I allow myself to play imaginatively with things. That there are no uh, rights and wrongs initially, because you're just generating an idea for something, a musing of, of something. As things develop, you curate it. So... I, I, uh, that if you're doing that, you're not. You don't have an artist block. You you're actually engaged with doing the do, <laughs> if you like. Um, but yeah, I mean, if somebody randomly came up to you and went, "Do me a picture," and you went, uh, "What of? You know, where's your source of inspiration? <laughs> you know, what interests you? What do you love? What do you hate? What what's inspiring to you? Um, what the artworks are saying something to you?" who your influences um, I often tell people to write in my class I get people to say write down the thing that they love the things that they hate and a piece of music that means something to them and they can do that quite quick and that's a starting off point for a conversation about what it is they would like to do do you want to react to something do you want to celebrate something? What flavour of it you want to create? So the music is a flavour. Your reaction can be the things that you don't like. Uh, your enthusiasm for some will be about things that you love. And it doesn't necessarily mean um, the things that are nearest and dearest to you personally, but you might love uh, monochrome and all the different variations of it and you know uh, like I did with the black I was talking earlier about black white movies um, and the lighting that you use in the chiaroscuro effect well, I'll go and investigate chiaroscuro it gives you a direction in which to investigate and once you start to investigate you start to formulate ideas you start to muse over stuff and think about things okay okay chiaroscuro other things okay things that I love um, I, love I love when you walk, when you walk through a park on a Sunday morning. I'm making this up in my head. We love when you walk through a park on a Sunday morning, on a quiet Sunday morning. 
the one or two people who are around at that stage who might be sitting on the park bench feeding the birds have such a quiet contentment to them I'd love to do that and I'll do that in Monaco now I'm bringing these two things together it's a personal experience I'm not trying to be overly clever and have a fully formulated uh, conceptualized idea for something that might take time to develop it might, it might turn into something about social isolation, social isolation during COVID. You know, it could develop into that idea. It can go in lots of different directions. But you're the artist; you can curate it. You've got the choice, and no choice is wrong. You just, you know, if you make one choice here and don't do this, you can go back to it later on, and it could be another idea for another range of work. So. Uh, there's a freedom with that. I think where we get a lot of people get tripped up is um, trying to be right, and I think that comes from our schooling. Um, you know, 